prayer, everyone can turn to Mark chapter 8, please, in your Bibles, if you have one this morning. Mark chapter 8, we'll just be looking at this passage. We're going to continue what we talked about last week, but uh, we're just going to focus on the second point of the message. And Nick, I'm losing my mind today. I forgot my water and my remote. So you just advance the simple two points when we get there. I'd appreciate it. Now, when we're born into this world, God gives all of us a conscience. We all have that thing that makes us feel bad when we do bad. The conscience is that gift from God that we all get immediately when we're born, and it develops as we age, and we can understand it, but it is that thing within us that we don't like because when we're doing something we want to do that we shouldn't do, it tells us, bad idea. Lights go off. Bad idea. It's intended to keep us from the consequences of making bad decisions, in particular, immoral decisions. The conscience is to the soul what pain is to the body. No one likes pain, but pain tells us that something's wrong, right? Pain says, hey, look at your leg. Look at your heart. Look at I wondered what you were so carefully coming up to do. Give me some water. Wow. This is, uh, thank you. In front of everybody. Thank you, Raymond. I appreciate that. Um, but pain, no one likes pain. But if you didn't have pain, you wouldn't know what's going on. I talked to somebody here just recently. They had this terrible back pain on Christmas Day of this past year, and they weren't used to back pain, so they assumed that it had to do with pulling a muscle or some type of injury, but it went away after a day. But he was uncomfortable just dealing with something that happened without explanation, so he went and saw the doctor, and the doctor, after a few tests, said, you have a very serious tumor growing on your kidney. This man is in his late 30s, and he has had no explanation for it. The doctor said it's been growing for 10 years. And he's convinced that had he not felt that pain, that that would have continued and potentially been mortal for him down the road. So pain, we hate it, but in many cases, it's a gift from God to tell us something's wrong with our body that we should address. The conscience is the same way. We don't like the conscience because it doesn't let us enjoy the things we want to do when they're not good things, but it's to tell us, hey, alert, something's wrong. You need to stop doing what you're doing. If we allow it, the conscience will lead us to eternal salvation. If we allow our conscience to be strong and powerful in our minds, we will be reminded that we're sinners on a daily basis. We'll be reminded that we have some evil inside of us, some immorality inside of us that needs to be addressed. The conscience points out our sin. And when we acknowledge our sin is perpetual, it's problematic, we continue to do it, we will be reminded because of the conscience that we need outside help. We need external help. We need we need someone or something to save us from our sin. So the conscience points out our sin. Our sin then points out we need a Savior. And if we have enough sense, we'll listen to what the Bible says at that point. Because the Bible says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We then can accept the gospel when we realize we're sinful people. Most people who don't accept the gospel are those who reject that they're sinful. They reject that they're bad. They reject that they need anybody's help. Most people who don't want Christ say, I'm fine on my own. I may not be perfect, but I'm not that bad. I may not be perfect, but I haven't done anything that bad. Surely God would never punish me for my sins compared to all those people. Did you see what those people did? Uh, they photoshopped their kids into pictures, and they took positions from other people, and, and they abused their money and power. I'm not that bad. We always look at everyone else to determine our goodness. When we should look and listen to our conscience. The conscience doesn't care who else is good or bad. The conscience is ours. And the conscience tells us what we are doing we shouldn't do. And when we continue to do what we shouldn't do, we then realize we need help. We need help, and that's where Jesus comes in, thankfully. When we receive Christ as our Savior, we receive many things. We receive, first and foremost, eternal forgiveness. Sins, past, present, and future, are washed into the blood. Jesus came to take away all of our sins, not just the ones we've already committed, not just the ones that we've accepted, not the ones that we've repented of, but He came to take them all away. He came to take him all the way for good, for eternity. 
when we receive Jesus Christ, we receive eternal life. Not temporary eternal life, not eternal life for a little bit, but eternal life, everlasting life. We then receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. We receive, among other things, a new spiritual nature of any man being Christ. He is a new creature. That's that new nature that we are, are then given. And what we receive when we receive Jesus Christ is we receive the mind of Christ. That's why I read last week 1 Corinthians 2.16 where Paul said, We have the mind of Christ. Our first birth in this world, our natural birth into this world, we receive a conscience that's intended to keep us alive, that's intended to keep us sensitive before God. It's when you become a Christian, you become born again, the second birth, that the, the conscience is not necessarily that important. We receive the mind of Christ. The conscience, it, it pulsates to what we do and, and what we shouldn't do and tells us what's right from wrong. The mind of Christ is a whole step up. The whole, the whole thing about the mind of Christ is it changes us. We don't need the conscience if we have the mind of Christ. Jesus didn't need the help of the conscience because he was perfect. He was holy. He was sinless. He didn't need something to tell him what was wrong. He had the mind to do that which was right. So the Christian doesn't need the conscience. The Christian merely needs to accept the mind of Christ. That's the advantage the believer has over the unbeliever, not only in eternity, but in this world. Now, unfortunately, unbelievers, many of them, choose to ignore the conscience. They choose to oppress and silence that which tells them, uh, stop doing that. And sadly, I'm sure that happened last night. Now, there's a reason people flood their souls with alcohol. It's because it quiets the conscience. It numbs and dumbs the mind to know what's right from wrong. And so people make bad decisions when they're intoxicated. But if you're saved this morning, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you must understand that you and I can be equally as guilty of ignoring not just the conscience, but ignoring the mind of Christ. We can oppress and silence the mind of Christ within us, just like someone can oppress and silence the conscience. Some people can be so uh, uh, angry towards the conscience and so obstinate towards the conscience that the conscience stops speaking. And so too, as Christians, we can be so obstinate, so stubborn, so resilient to the new nature within us, the mind of Christ, that the mind of Christ will go numb. That Christ, the nature in us, will go silent. That's why we're addressing the need to grow in our Christianity, the, to, the need to become more like Christ. True Christian growth is a brain transplant. It's taking hours removing it and replacing it with Jesus's. It's a voluntary decision on a daily basis to die to self and to become more like Christ, to lose our minds in order to find Jesus Christ's mind. True Christian growth is the process of becoming less like us, more like Christ, the process of thinking less like us and more like Christ. And when we are truly growing in our faith, we will begin to think differently. And when we think differently, we will begin to feel differently. And when we, and when we feel differently, we will begin finally to live differently. That's the process. It's new mindset, new perspective, new feeling, new opinion, and new decisions, new life. I was talking to a couple not too long ago, right in the upper lobby there, and I was asking how they were doing, and they're growing in their faith. I'm excited for them. I asked about some things that they're involved in outside of church, some hobbies, some recreation, and they began to, to look at me with little luster of excitement about that which they loved to do. And I sensed in them a, a, a fizzling out of the passion for this recreation. So I said, what's going on? Pastor, we just, I don't know, we just don't enjoy it anymore. We just don't like hanging out with that group anymore. We've done it for years. And I said, well, did something happen? No, nothing happened. No one did anything wrong. There wasn't an incident. He said to me, the husband just said, it doesn't fancy us anymore. We don't feel comfortable there anymore. We don't enjoy doing that anymore. And of course, I'm smirking internally because what's happening is they're growing in their faith. And God is taking away their old life. 
and they are realizing that there's no place like home. There's no place like church. There's nobody like a Christian. There's nobody like family here. There's nothing like coming to a service. There's nothing like being preached at. There's nothing like being taught the Word of God. And their life is changing. People are calling them. What's wrong? You're not like you used to be. Their answer is, I don't know. Something's changing. Yeah. You're losing your old life. You're losing your mind. You're getting a new mind, a new perspective. If we choose the mind of Christ, watching movies with profanity will be uncomfortable. You ever watch a movie now or look at, you go to TV and, oh, I, I, this was years ago, and you watch it and you say to yourself, I don't remember all this profanity. I don't remember this scene. Ah, then you're growing. You're recognizing that you tolerated things years ago that you shouldn't tolerate, and you're not tolerating. If we choose the mind of Christ, consuming alcohol won't be enjoyable. I didn't say you won't do it. I don't say you won't want it. But when you do consume it, you'll say, this wasn't as fun as it used to be. I don't like the way I feel uh, after drinking like I used to. If you choose the mind of Christ, carnal music will not sound good anymore. You know why I don't preach on specific things too much, like what you should do, what you shouldn't do? Because I don't want you to be worried about what the pastor says or doesn't say. I don't want you to have a list of things that pastor says I shouldn't do this or pastor says I should do this. I want you to do whatever you want to do. And I want the Holy Spirit to, inside of you, say, this isn't where you should be. This isn't what you should be doing. Because that, to me, is true growth. We're not looking for anybody to comply. When you become a member, you simply have to be born again, baptized, and submit to the statement of faith here. And you're a member. We don't say, be uh, born again, be baptized, submit to the statement of faith, and agree to never do this, that, this, that, this, that, wear this, go there, see this, drink that. No. You have liberty before God to do as you wish. But if you're growing in the faith, your mind will change. Your decisions will change. And you'll become more like Christ. That is true growth. If you choose the mind of Christ, fornication won't be enjoyable. And whatever it is we used to do or want to do, we can still do it. But it just won't be that enjoyable. Now, just because we have the mind of Christ as believers, as I mentioned last week, doesn't mean we use the mind of Christ, unfortunately. The mind of man and the mind of Christ are vastly different. And there will be a constant struggle in our lives to deny the natural mind and to accept the divine mind. We started last week by looking at Luke chapter 2 and we saw that Jesus as a 12-year-old boy went to the temple and sat beneath the doctors and teachers of the scriptures while his family walked back to Nazareth and for three days they couldn't find Jesus. Mary and Joseph run into the temple and there he is and, oh, Jesus, what are you doing to us? We were looking for you everywhere. You're, you're at church. We're all the way halfway home. Your cousins are with us. What are you doing here? His response was classic. No emotion. What's the problem? What did you think I was going to be doing? I have to be busy about my father's business. Twelve years old. And Mary and Joseph were perplexed, like, be busy about your father's business. Everyone else is playing football. Everyone else is playing sports. You're busy about your father's business in, in the temple? They couldn't understand his mindset as a 12-year-old boy that he'd rather be in church than head back to the family reunion. And he looked at them astonished, like, why are you so surprised? Who wouldn't want to be in church instead of the family get-together? That's what Jesus was thinking. Very different perspectives. You see, in Jesus' mind, a husband's first love, a wife's first love, a father's first love, a mother's first love isn't for family, it's for God. And that doesn't mean they don't love their families. It doesn't mean they don't love their wives and husbands and, and fathers and daughters and sons and, and brothers and sisters intently and passionately, but no one's love here should compete with our love for there. That was Jesus' mindset. And so we learned first that the Father, in Jesus' mind, takes precedent over the family. Here in Mark chapter 8, we're going to learn a second thing real quick here. Jesus, in Mark chapter 8, was having a three-day revival meeting, and the audience was getting hungry. They were getting tired. They were out of food. He feeds them in miraculous fashion, 4,000 of them, with only seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. And in verse number 8, I'm starting to pick up my speed in which I'm speaking, so get your ears ready. Verse number 8, So they did eat, the 4,000 that is, and were filled. 
and they took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets. Verse number 10. Everyone's all full. Straightway Jesus enters into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Delmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question uh, with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. <sighs> Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the leaven of Herod. Verse 16, the disciples reasoned among themselves, saying, oh, It's because we have no bread. Jesus is telling us, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, because we forgot to get the bread. Verse 17, And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, saith unto them Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet? Neither understand? Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? Having ears, hear ye not? And do ye not remember when I broke, when I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets of full fragments took ye up? They said, uh, twelve. Verse number 20, and when the seven among four thousand, you know, the ones we just fed, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, seven. And look what he says in verse 21. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Now, if you don't understand what he's saying either, I'll help you. He tells them, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. It'll corrupt you. It's bad news. And they think, You're telling us to beware of the lev leaven. Leaven? Well, that's in bread. <gasps> we didn't take bread. We're now in a boat. We forgot bread. He is going to be unhappy. We don't have enough food. Jesus says, you, you're kidding, right? You remember we just fed 5,000 people? How many loaves were left after that? Twelve. All right, and we just got done feeding 4,000 people. How many loaves were left? Seven. Do you really think, guys, I care if you bring bread or not? I can feed 13 guys on my own. I don't need your help to remember the bread. I just fed 5,000, 4,000, that's 9,000. 13 people, not a problem. Why would you guys even think that I would be concerned about bread? And in Matthew, don't turn there. This is what Jesus says in addition. He says, how is it that ye do not understand that I spake not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees, the teaching of the Sadducees. As with his parents in Luke 2, he and his disciples were on two entirely different pages. He was thinking spiritual, they were thinking physical. He was thinking teaching, they were thinking eating. He was thinking instruction, they were thinking nutrition. He was thinking uh, learning, they were thinking feeding. Two entirely different pages. Physical, carnal. I'm sorry, spiritual, carnal. Spiritual, physical. What is the perspective of Jesus Christ, the mind of Jesus Christ? It is this. It's not complicated, but it is so contrary to us. The invisible takes precedent over the visible. When Jesus thinks, he doesn't think about what he sees first in the physical dimension. He thinks about what he sees first in the spiritual dimension. When we think, feed me, Jesus thinks, teach me. We are not that way, perhaps you've noticed. And if you want to argue in your mind like, oh no, pastor, I'm a spiritually minded person. If you're married... What was the first thing you thought about when dating or looking for a prospective, prospective spouse? If you say anything other than looks, you need to come forward and repent. 
Nobody, nobody gets online to date or goes out to find someone to date or starts looking around to date. Nobody, and I mean capital letters, bold, underlined twice, exclamation point, I'll put every dollar in the world on it. Nobody says, all that matters to me is personality. All that matters to me is as long as they're complimentary, I'm looking for someone who's good for me. I test young people all the time. I was just in the car with some young people yesterday. They were at an event, and two young ladies and my wife, and I said to these young ladies, I said, any good-looking boys there? And they always prove my point. Because women, I understand looks don't mean anything to you. Guys are the only ones that care about looks, right? That's what you try to say. So I asked these young ladies, any good-looking guys? Well, we thought so. But then we got close, not so much. <laughs> to which I responded, I said, I thought it's all about personality. Well, I'm going to look at them for the rest of my life. I said, oh, so it does matter what people look like. Everybody looks at the appearance, the face, the shape, the size, the hair color, the eye color. That's what we start with. You think I ended up with a beautiful wife because I went out on a mission to find a great godly woman who knew everything about the Bible? No. I happened to find her in church, but I said, that one among the 20 that were standing up here, I like her. She looks the best. I'm going for her. <laughs> I didn't say, oh, hey, that ugly one, she's probably more spiritual. I'll, I'll go for her. No. We go for the prize because we're governed by eyes. And yes, I have to look at my wife the rest of my life, and I like what I see. Why would I not want to pick something I'd like to see? We all do that. That's our nature. We look, and that's what governs our mind. But Jesus isn't so. You know, when Jesus says sheep, we think about fuzzy farm animals, but he's talking about the children of God. When he says water, we think about H2O, and he's thinking about salvation. When he says bread, we think about carbs, and he's talking about himself. In John chapter 6, he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And at the time when he said that, they're like, what? How is he going to give of his flesh for us to eat? They actually thought he meant, come eat me. That was the mindset of these people. They were thinking, chewing on Jesus himself. And he's, he's thinking about what he can offer, who he is. Jesus saw the kingdom of God before he saw the kingdom of man. He saw the spiritual battle before he saw the physical battle. We have the mind of Christ inside of us but we don't choose it very often. Ask yourself, what do you think about more, the visible or the invisible? What do you think about easier, the spiritual battle or the piggy bank? What do you think about when changes are made in your company, in your family, or in your church? Do you think about how it impacts your belly first or how it impacts your soul first? We make decisions first based on our our eyes, based on our appetite, based on our feelings. Lord willing, we'll have a building project this year to celebrate. The mind of man first sees the color of the paint on the new walls. But it will be the mind of Christ who first sees the expanded space for the expansion of the gospel. The man of mine will first see the color of the carpet on the new floors. But it will be the mind of Christ who first sees the increased opportunity to meet and greet a soul in need of forgiveness. The danger with the mind of man is it emphasizes the physical, which then puts a priority on the carnal, and that leads to a very selfish, a very sensitive mindset. Where Jesus' mind thinks on the invisible first, which then places the emphasis on the spiritual, which results in in an unselfish and sound mindset. Try it out tomorrow when you go to work and you see your coworkers. Do you see coworker first or the soul of the coworker first? Go to school. Do you see the classmate first or do you see the soul of the classmate first? Look at your home, your spouse, your kids, your siblings. Do you see family members or do you see souls in your home? When we begin to erect walls here, Lord willing, will you see dollars on those walls first or will you see souls on those walls first? When attendance, Lord willing, increases, will you see a bigger church that impacts you or will you see souls, more of them, that can be impacted for eternity? You look at Jesus Christ and his ministry. He didn't get upset over the visible, but he did many times get upset over the invisible. 
He was in the temple one day and he sees all the people exchanging animals and they're selling merchandise and he got all upset and he, and he drove the animals out. What was he upset about? Was he upset that the animals were making a mess in the church or was he upset that there was covetousness in the church? Spiritual. When a woman anointed Jesus with ointment, this precious ointment, and it poured down his face, was he upset of this waste of money? No. The physical, the visible, that didn't bother him. What bothered him was his disciples being full of covetousness. The spiritual bothered him. It grieves me that Christians can be more passionate about guns than abortion. Visible over the invisible. Physical over spiritual. It grieves me that Christians can be more enthusiastic about constitutional rights than they are about moral plights. I'm sharing my heart with you this morning so you understand how important this topic is for each of us to confront in our own lives. It grieves me that Christians can be more emotional about what a church looks like than what a church acts like. It grieves me that Christians can be more concerned with the size of the church than with the responsibility of the church. It grieves me that Christians can be more sensitive to how a church communicates than how a church congregates. People, our perspective needs to change. Our mindset needs to change. And not to a better mindset, but to a different mindset. To the mind of Christ. A church governed by the mind of Christ is a church destined for the power of Christ. Jesus always pointed people to the invisible. He was very conscious of the visible. That's why he used the visible to explain the invisible. He talked about parables, things we could understand and see to explain spiritual truths. But at the end of the day, it was Jesus who said, Therefore, take no thought. Therefore, take no thought about what we shall eat or what we shall drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, I can't see that. I can't put a poster on my wall to remind me. I, I don't have a visual of what that is. Exactly. We have to think first invisible and let that take care of the visible. We have to seek first that which we cannot see so we can trust him to take care of what we can see. The mind of Christ puts a precedent on the invisible over the visible. You see, in Christ's mind, this is his mind now. It's hard for us to relate, but in his mind, why wouldn't I be in a temple? Why does it even strike you as strange? Why wouldn't I be here? And then he says, why would you think about bread? Why wouldn't your mind first go to the doctrine, to the teaching, to the fact that their teaching could corrupt you like leaven corrupts bread? Why did you go first to the bread? Because I went first to the teaching. You see how vastly different it is? It needs to be a brain transplant, a transformation. This message is intended to be a gauge for you to know where you are in your Christian walk. As you go through your day today, as you go through your week this week, ask yourself, what do you think about first? What is it that riles you up? What is it that gets you thinking? What is it that gets you emotional? What is it that gets you sensitive? Is it the visible or the invisible, the spiritual or the physical? That which you can see or that which you cannot see. That will then tell you where you are. What you see indicates who you are. And so we need to have a change of mind. Let's stand and have a word of prayer before the baptism.